I got a question. Uh, if we can review that, so we can review that, no problem. Uh, let's see. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. So this is about regulating blood flow, uh, which is kind of important. You don't want too much. You don't want too little. Uh, when you get changes in blood flow, you get. Uh, Potentially changes in brain function. Um, you, you know, certainly you've stood up too fast before, as they say, and you get a little lightheaded. And the results, you step up out of your blood. We want to make sure that our brain always has enough blood because it's greedy. Um, it's going to use far more glucose and oxygen by weight than any other part of the body. And that's because it has a whole bunch of very expensive cells in it. Um, let's see. So we'll talk about a couple ways that we regulate blood flow. And the movement of blood is how we study the brain now, uh, at least in people. We've come a long way. It wasn't that long ago that we used to do lobotomies uh, to treat behavior disorders, like psychopathies or, or just maybe acted out a little bit. Not the really serious problems, I guess. Here's the weird thing about lobotomies. The majority of them were done on women. Yet, our prison populations are overwhelmingly male. Doesn't that represent the real problem population? 90% of criminals are males. Yet, at least 60% of lobotomies were done on women. Kind of strange. It wasn't until about the 1970s that we stopped doing lobotomies here in this country. France did it until the 80s. But we stopped because it left in its wake a, a trail of about 40,000 bodies. That's about all they were at that point. If you want a little light reading over the break, look up Rosemary Kennedy. You probably heard of her brother John. He was president for a little while. Then he got murdered. And that sounds awful until you read about his sister, Rosemary. Um, nowadays, we don't do lobotomies. We study people's brains non invasively. We don't jam an ice pick right up in here, hammer it on through, and then scrape it back and forth a little bit until they become incoherent then you know your job's done. Yeah? Would you pull lobotomies down under like, just like anesthesia, like they didn't even knock them all the way out, they just kind of... They shock them. Yeah. So it just immobilize them, because it only takes a couple of minutes. It's really quick, really brutal, but really quick. And if they can still walk, they can walk away afterward. Or if she gets a black eye and a ruined life. But all you see is the black eye immediately. So, nowadays though, we're a little better. We're still not right, but we're less wrong. 
So we study the brain with MRI. And the basis of functional MRI is by studying a change in blood flow. That's what we look at. Because we know that we're going to change our blood flow whenever we have a change in activity. So if this neuron all of a sudden becomes very active, and it wasn't before, it's going to need more ATP. Somehow, this activity is going to translate to a change in blood flow. This is what we measure with MRI, sometimes called whole MRI, blood oxygenation level dependent MRI. That's what it's bold about. We look at the change in blood oxygenation. Surprisingly, maybe, Whenever we have an increase in activity, we actually see an increase in blood oxygenation levels. There's more oxygen there. Now this might sound surprising to you, because they're more active. They need more ATP, and when we make ATP, we burn up our oxygen. But while we're doing that, we stimulate an increase in blood flow. So we actually have a net increase in oxygenation. Yes, we're burning more, but we're supplying a whole lot more than we're burning up. That might seem confusing. More activity, more oxygen. We're not looking at the actual cause. We're looking at the response. That's what we're measuring with whole. How the body responds to this change in activity. So there's a few ways that we're going to increase blood flow based on activity. <clears throat> One obvious way is to measure potassium. All these little spikes. Now let's not forget lecture four. The action potential. Right, that depolarization from sodium rushing in. And the re and hyperpolarization from potassium rushing out. Every time a neuron is active, it's spitting out potassium. So you get this local increase. Now here's what's surprising. If we were to look at um, let's say the membrane potential for our vascular smooth muscle cells, Or the membrane potential. And there's an increase in potassium. That bad boy has to polarize. Believe it or not, that potassium is going to drive hyperpolarization. And this should make no sense to you because you've been paying attention. You remember the Nernst equation. Hell, I've told you when you have an increase in extracellular potassium, cells depolarize. I probably mentioned an except when they don't. This is when they don't. You've been paying attention. You remember the nerds. But maybe you forgot about that golden hydrogen cat's question. I knew that would jar. A little bit of memory there. Maybe some emotion too. Those are connected, I hear. <laughs> Why do we hyperpolarize? Well, let's think about this. The reversal for potassium. What's going to happen whenever we increase extracellular potassium? Is our reversal going to depolarize or hyperpolarize? <laughs> The reversal is going to depolarize. That's true. And not by a ton. But a few millivolts, no doubt. You can get out that handy dandy nerds equation spreadsheet and plug in 
15 millimolar for the extracellular potassium. And let's see, it'll be polarizing. But what we have to keep in mind is that permeability of potassium also changes. We have potassium sensing potassium channels. So the permeability of potassium increases whenever we have an increase in extracellular potassium. Both of these things occur. If you just think about the reversal, this makes no sense. But that's not the only thing that's going on. Yeah, my reversal is going to depolarize a little bit, but it's still below my membrane potential. The bigger effect here is that change in permeability. I move much closer to potassium's reversal as a result of all that neuronal activity. This neuron's over here firing away and spitting out its potassium. Yes, the reversal will change, but more importantly, that muscle cell becomes far more permeable to potassium. As a result, it hyperpolarizes and relaxes. So this blood vessel dilates and that increases my blood flow. In an area where I have a lot of neuronal activity, hyperpolarization of my smooth muscle cells is going to increase blood flow. So now I'm going to supply those active neurons with more blood. We don't want to bathe the whole brain in more blood if only parts of it are more active. Let's say we're looking at a, a, a visually stimulating movie or something like that. There's going to be a whole lot more activity back here. This is where we need blood. If we're listening to music, here's where we need the blood. We don't need to bathe our occipital lobes with more blood, just where we have the activity. And that's the basis of that MRI. Let's look at the blood, and we'll use that as a proxy for neuronal activity. It's not perfect. I won't go into why it's not perfect unless you really want me to, but it's not perfect. Nothing is right. But it is way less wrong than jamming ice picks into people's heads. So we got potassium. That's an option. We can also use nitric oxide. Yeah. So why is this only affecting the vasculature and not the nerves nearby as well? Oh yeah, that'll, that'll affect this too, yeah. So it's not gonna cause... Oh, wait. It won't be too bad though. I mean, let's not forget, we still have astrocytes here. I mean, this potassium isn't just floating around uncontrolled. We'll stop it up. But there's an option. Now that potassium is also going to act on astrocytes and they're going to spit out basoactive compounds like prostaglandins. So they'll play a role too. Um, but I think I've mentioned nitric oxide. So all this spiking, we're spitting out potassium. What we're also doing is increasing the amount of calcium that we have in this cell. When we increase calcium in the neuron, calcium is going to act as a secondary messenger. And one of the things that it's going to do is stimulate neuronal nitric oxide synthase. This is the enzyme that synthesizes nitric oxide, just as the name suggests. So, lots of activity, increases calcium, nitric oxide synthase gets stimulated. The neuron then releases nitric oxide. Nitric oxide then stimulates vasodilation. Just like it did in lecture 11. All that stuff is still true. 
So whether the nitric oxide is coming from an epithelial cell surrounding the blood vessel or from a nearby neuron, it's still going to cause vasodilation. So when we're active, we get an increase in blood flow. Could be because of changes in potassium. Could be because we're spitting out nitric oxide. Could be because of several factors from astrocytes that we won't go into. It could also be because of a change in pH. Oh boy. The last thing I think that I mentioned. The change in pH. So one option, potassium. The other option, nitric oxide. Now remember, activity is going to drop the pH. When a neuron's active, that's going to stimulate, of course, ATP synthesis. This uses up oxygen, creates carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide then creates carbonic acid when it hits water. Water is everywhere. So the last thing that we have to consider is that drop of pH that accompanies living. Every living thing is going to create acid just by the simple facts of making ATP. You're all making acid right now. And that acid <clears throat> can affect the structure of proteins, can affect the function of cells. One of the things that it's going to do is change how much calcium we have floating around in our vascular smooth muscle cells. I think I presented the relationship where calcium is positively related to pH. Increase the pH, increase calcium. So what happens when we drop pH? We decrease calcium. That drop in pH makes the smooth muscle relax. Because remember, calcium is a secondary messenger. It's going to act on those calcium-dependent kinases that phosphorylate turn on myosin light chain kinase. So when we decrease calcium, we decrease active myosin interactions and we get vasodilation. So yet again, activity drives an increase in blood flow. Yeah. So when you say increased calcium causes the release of the nitric oxide synthase, that's from the neuron. Yes. But this calcium decreasing is from the blood vessel. Yes, exactly. In the vascular smooth muscle. The amount of intracellular calcium that they have is related to the extracellular pH. When the pH is high, they have an increase in calcium, they constrict. pH drops, decrease in calcium, causes relaxation. That drop in pH is most likely caused by an increase in carbon dioxide production activity. So there's a few ways that the neurons can regulate local blood flow. And that's why we think blood flow is an okay estimate of neural activity. And it is okay. It's way better than nothing. Then there was a question about the barrel reflex. So this is going to be more global regulation of blood flow. Let's create a, a, a sympathetic or a parasympathetic response to make sure I don't pump too much or too little blood into my head. So this will be stimulated by more changes in body position than the, the changes in neural activity. So the, the subtle changes are right there. The global change would be the barrel reflex. So the pressure reflex, the barrel reflex, it's gonna work like it did before. So we gotta have some stretch receptors out there on some blood vessels. If you were to do a handstand, blood would rush into your head. 
there'd be an increase in blood pressure then. So what we want to do is try to decrease the amount of blood flow going to the head, maybe directed elsewhere. We can kind of do that a little bit with the real reflex. I can totally overcome it. Your head will still turn red and you should eventually turn upright. But what we can do is sense blood pressure. So let's say we're on the carotid. That's of course cranial nerve nine. And this will enter into the baroreceptive nucleus in the solitary tract. So we're back in the nucleus of the solitary tract. Solitary sensory. Pretty simple relay. Cytatory down to our nucleus ambiguous. More specifically for the vagus, that vagus is going to create parasympathetic output. We'll hit a mural ganglion, and then that will inhibit the output of the heart, for example, and help us drop blood pressure. So if there's an increase in blood pressure, that stimulates Decrease pressure. Now, of course, we can't forget our bottle ventral lateral medulla, which inhibits the rostral ventral lateral medulla, which has those adrenergic neurons that stimulate our sympathetic output. We all remember this. That jump. Depressor and the pressor centers. So, again, when we have an increase, we'll stimulate this inhibitor, but we don't have a sympathetic outflow. That's it. The same thing that ever was. If there's a drop in blood pressure, the reduced stimulation of the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve there. Decrease activity in the solitary tract nucleus, so we decrease our parasympathetic output, less inhibition. We also have less inhibition of our pressor center, so we have a synthetic response. So if there's not quite enough blood heading up that internal parotid to the head, have a sympathetic response. Pump a little more blood out of the heart, because we want to maintain a fairly stable level of blood flow to the brain. Not enough, you pass out. Too much, you might rupture a vessel. That's no good either. So we're looking for a Goldilocks range, just like we are with everything else. And uh, the Y is, oh goodness, minus. It's a nice healthy range where we want to live. Too high? That's bad. Too low? Oh, hypoxia or insert your own terrible event down here. We want to have enough blood flow that our neurons can get nourishment. But they don't have any change in intracranial pressure. But that still sucks. All right. I think that handles that. Uh, is there anything that's confusing about the um, local regulation? When you say local regulation, is that in? Anything confusing about the barrel reflex? Global regulation, in other words. So we keep a fairly stable supply of blood with the barrel reflex. And then we just kind of divvy it up. 
to different areas of the brain based on how active they are with those three mechanisms outlined there. So if we say that there's a change in amygdala activity, for example, when people look at frightened faces, what we're really saying is that there's a change in blood flow. That's what we're looking at. So keep that in mind when you're looking at the fMRI stuff. We're really looking at change in blood, nothing more. Let's see, is there anything we're drawing out? Well, I don't know, maybe the stuff I drew. I don't know. Hard to say if anything's worth it, really. Um, so that quite something we'll handle as we go through these others. Concepts in question two. So what the hell is question two? Question two on the post quiz. Because I'm high uh, Let's see what that is. Question two. I should know the order of all the questions that are written. Okay, transport of proteins to the blood-brain barrier. Okay, all right, so I guess we need to talk about the blood-brain barrier. <laughs> Zoomers, is everything okay? <laughs> okay, excellent. Oh, dandy, my goodness. Better over there than in here. Is anyone dandy here? Almost. Nice. Nice. Today is a great day, by the way. Why is that? Last lecture. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that great? Uh, okay, blood brain barrier. This is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> So, on occasion, nasty things enter our blood. Sometimes we get boo-boos. The skin does a pretty good job of keeping stuff out. We're covered in bacteria. Hell, I even hear that we're dirtier after we shower because we pull bacteria out of the nooks and crannies. I heard it somewhere. It must be true. <laughs> And we probably all wash with different you know, degrees of thoroughness, and probably different soaps matter, but anyway, we're covered in filth. And our skin does a pretty good job of keeping it out. But we get breaks, it happens. When that happens, well, we don't want any of that filth to get into the brain. So the blood-brain barrier is gonna help us here. Blood-brain barrier is gonna present some problems when we do wanna get things into the brain such as new experimental drugs, they oftentimes don't. So with the exception of our circumventricular organs, you know, those areas that circumvent the blood-brain barrier, we have very tight connections between the epithelial cells that make up our blood vessels. We call them tight junctions, in fact. That's how tight they are. Now, normally what you want in a capillary bed is for stuff to leave and enter. That's kind of the point. So your capillary beds kind of have these little perforations in them. Once they hit the local supply so that we can get exchange. We move blood around so we can move stuff around. And this is great for the exchange of material. It just doesn't happen in the brain with the exception of those certain particular organs. Everywhere else, yeah, we'll create some capillary beds my very simplistic drawing of the capillary bed. There's some branching, but they're still tight. You look at those epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are just nice little cuboid 
shape cells. They got these happy little tight junctions between them. Even though they're two separate cells, they're not really fused, the tight junction prevents even the ions from passing. Tight junctions you should think of as pretty much impermeable. So we can't wriggle between the epithelial cells to enter the brain. So if you're a little bacterium floating around because we got a boo-boo, no dice. You can't leave the blood and enter the brain. Now the brain can't repair itself for the most part. The neurons that you have now, it's all you got. And as they slowly die away, so do you. Over the years, you'll continue to lose your neurons and, and lose your ability to learn information easily. It's hard now, but it'll only get harder. You'll lose memories. Life will get worse in many ways. But it'll also get better. You'll be more financially stable. You'll give fewer bucks. Like <laughs> Part of that has to do with losing neurons. So it's not all bad. So these tight junctions are really the blood-brain barrier. The impermeable portion of it, that is. There's two functions of the blood-brain barrier. Keep stuff out. Tight junctions are going to do that. The other thing that it does is let some stuff in. The default is no. Just like in many places. No, you may not come in. Unless I know you. Is your name on the list? This is the velvet rope. The list would be a collection of proteins. And if you can stick to them or move through them, you can come on in. Now, there's a few ways of getting through our blood-brain barrier. One possibility is free diffusion. The only way you can do this is if you freely move through membranes. You have to be nonpolar, in other words. Oxygen, carbon dioxide are great examples of molecules that aren't polar and therefore move through membranes just fine. So these bum rush the glove. They just move on in. They don't stop, interact with the bouncer, and nice orderly fashion move into the club. They just move on freely. Go on into club cortex. The other option is to interact with the protein. And we got a few different types of these. Some kind of special little protein here. Well, let's look at the different types. And really, we can just simplify this to two. Isn't that nice? Some are going to be what we call transporter proteins, where they don't quite make a channel. And what they have to do is change their shape. So they'll flip flop back and forth to move stuff. Transporters are also called barriers because they hold on to the material. They don't just make a channel. So if we want to move something yummy, like glucose, across our blood-brain barrier, and boy, do we want to use, do we want to move glucose? It's going to need to bind to the glucose transporter. There's going to have to be a shape change. So it binds it on the outside. Glucose transporter undergoes a shape change and exposes it to the inside and lets it go. It's not a channel, it's much slower. Not 
1,000 times slower. Glucose is just too darn big and too darn water soluble to move across the membrane. Luckily, its name is on the list. We have glucose transporters. Um, glutes. And glucose transporters are clearly important for proper brain function. But we have deficiencies in glucose transporters. Our brains just don't grow enough. We're nowhere near as smart if we have glucose transporter insufficiency. So mutations that affect this action right here, moving glucose from the blood into the brain, Blood. Deficiencies in glucose transport lead to deficiencies in brain growth and function. Yes. So once it gets inside the cell, it can go out of it freely or are there transport? Okay. Excellent question. Every single membrane that's going to move glucose has to have a glucose transport. Yeah. Um, the glial one at the end, is it like butted up against where those pet junctions are, or is it like? Yes, sir. Here's your glial limitans right here. Bunch of input processes from the astrocytes. They surround every blood vessel. So those transporters can go through the pet junctions and the real limitations, or do they have a separate transporter? Oh yeah, we got glucose transporters. They need to pick it up too. They gotta eat. They also gotta transport it to neurons. But yeah, every cell has gotta have a glucose transporter. Glucose can't cross membranes without it. Related to this, We can also have receptor-mediated endocytosis. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Endocytosis into the cell. We're going to bring stuff into the cell using receptors. Here's another place where your name could be on the list. We'll do this for larger molecules like peptides. For example, insulin. Yeah, neurons can probably make some insulin. But they're not as productive as pain. We still get peripheral insulin into our central nervous system. And insulin is required for neurons to survive. We didn't know this, and that's why we struggled to grow neurons in dishes until sometime in the 1970s when we finally figured out we got to throw some insulin on there. It's got what neurons craved. Now the way that insulin crosses the blood-brain barrier is not through a transporter, instead it binds to its receptor, turns it on. Insulin is a, well, it doesn't matter. It's going to cause the endocytosis of that receptor into a little vesicle. So we trap our insulin right there. And then we're going to fuse that vesicle. So what we end up doing is moving insulin to the other side, where it can then unbind and go act on something else. So is that still? Uh, 
like the same receptors brings it in, or is it different? Uh, yeah, it's an insulin receptor. Yep. And um, a lot of these receptor tyrosine kinases get internalized when they get stimulated. Uh, you remember neurotrophins? They act on receptor tyrosine kinases and they cause internalization in the axon. It goes back to the cell body. Same type of receptor. So when receptor tyrosine kinases get activated, they get pulled inside. What this does to the blood brain barrier is allow the insulin and other peptides to then move into the central nervous system. But not any peptide. You've got to have the receptor for it. Then we have transporters. These are much faster than the receptor mediated in psychosis. So we don't have to actually internalize and then fuse. We just got to do a little bit of a shape change. It's a lot simpler if you're just oxygen or carbon dioxide. They're nonpolar, they zip on through. No proteins needed. But if you're big and you dissolve in water, like sugar or insulin, you're going to need a protein to help move you across. So there's the two components of our blood brain barrier tight junctions, connect our epithelial cells and create a essentially diffusion free connection between them. Keep stuff out. And then we have specific proteins that allow certain things in. This keeps our brains nice and squeaky clean. No nasty stuff. Unless there's a protein for it. So some viruses obviously can target the central nervous system. That's because they're able to cross with like a variant. That's what makes some viruses neurotrophic. Their name is on the list. Okay. We go through what blood supply covers which areas of the body. Yeah, we can do that. Sure. Um, let's see. I'll organize this into a table for you. You have that. You should have the broad areas, though. Especially your cerebral arteries. I mean, the others kind of have their names built into them. No, they all do, really. The Lamo perforating. What do you think that is? You know, your thalamus? I hope so. Where's your brain? I'm sorry, it's right there in the name. I can probably project. I should know how to do this. This will probably, if this works, it'll be faster than me drawing everything. Of course, it has to work. Um, God damn it, I need to add your rum. I think. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. New version. No, thank you. Okay. Maybe this? We'll see what happens. Oh, cool. Look at that. All right. Worked. So, three cerebral arteries. Now, the biggest one. Well, it's probably most commonly affected, just like it was last semester. Tell me middle. Exactly. Your middle cerebral artery, because this thing is usually continuous with the internal carotid. So if there's some junk floating in the internal carotid, well, it's just 
flaw and hit the middle cerebral. This chart is basically all you need to know. The names make sense. Start with the middle. So that's on the outside. And that hits all of the lobes. It gets them all. Anything is possible. And I'll distinguish this, but the, so the motor and somatosensory deficits, these are mostly going to affect face and upper limb. That's where they are in those body maps. Legs, trunk, well, that's going to be more interior cerebral artery. <clears throat> You can have auditory deficits, of course, with the middle cerebral artery. Keep in mind we're hitting here. We can hit the limbic system. There can be some olfactory deficits as well. This is where the olfactory system is going to enter first and then go to the thalamus. So there's a lot of possible problems here. I'll give you some examples in the table so you got that. But for middle cerebral artery, you should be thinking outsides, face and upper limb when it comes to motor and sensory deficits. You can get some obvious language deficits. Notice we're including a lot of the frontal lobes here, the lateral aspects of it. Language is lateralized usually to the left side. We got Broca's area right around here. Wernicke's area here, so you can get problems with producing sounds. First guy say, Tom. I think the first described patient with broken aphasia said, ta 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 only top. That's it. One syllable. It's all he can produce, but he can make sense of everything. Is this within that? Production, understanding. Both are served by the middle cerebral arteries. But it depends on which side you affect. Affect the left side, language. Right side, neglect. That's largely what we'll get with right side damage. We put language over here, we put all of our stuff over here. We lateralize the brain that way. You have a question? Yes, this is just something from Gross and that we learned that the uh, anterior bridge of the middle meningeal is the most like, most likely to be affected, I'm pretty sure. And then that part of this. Sounds about right. No, that probably has to do with the, the, the layout uh, coming up from the internal parotid, how it continues and then size. It's probably in the next Could be. Uh, so anyway, there's your middle cerebral artery. Now for the other two, now we're on the, the inside. So the medial aspects of the cerebrum, anterior is in the front, posterior is in the back. Just that simple. Posterior, obviously we're going to have a lot of visual deficits here. Memory as well. Include the thalamus. That makes pretty much anything possible at that point. Because all rows of the cortex lead through the thalamus. You can have sensory loss, you can have motor deficits with those perforating arteries there. I think we can see the perforating here. So they're all going to play some role in movement, no matter where they hit. They're going to affect aspects of the basal ganglia with their perforating branches. The middle cerebral artery obviously is going to affect the primary motor, motor cortex, as is the anterior cerebral artery. But the posterior can still affect movement, either the thalamus, subthalamic nucleus. No doubt there. I'll give you these in the table. The other ones to know, let's see here. Pontine arteries are pretty darn straightforward. These are the pons. 
you know, a lot of important things in the ponds related to movement, for example. So you get locked in syndrome when you have occlusion to the pontine arteries. These are going to branch off the basilar artery there. The midbrain is going to be served by a couple different arteries. So some of the perforating branches of the posterior uh, cerebral artery, as well as the superior cerebellar arteries. I'll give you that in the table now. So those can give you deficits with eye movements. Uh, or if they're uh, large infarcts, loss of consciousness. So those arising arousal fibers there are going to get uh, damaged. Obviously, the superior cerebellar arteries gets the superior cerebellum, hence the name. The inferior cerebellum is going to be served by the anterior and posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. So those names make a whole lot of sense. The um, anterior inferior cerebellar also hits some of the pons, so you might get lateral pontine syndrome. Posterior inferior will hit aspects of the medulla, so you get lateral medullary syndrome. And then that just leaves us with our spinal arteries. Anterior and posterior. They'll hit the medulla and, of course, the spinal cord. Front and back. Anterior and posterior. You can get obvious motor and sensory deficits. Anterior is going to affect our corticospinal tracts. Well, the anterolateral pathway, posterior, posterior columns. Notice there's two posteriors. We can get sightedness here. Here there's the one anterior spinal. So it's a little more likely that you'll get bilateral. But of course, if you have occlusion only on one of these four branches here, you can have unilateral damage as well. I'll give you that in the table. That might be helpful. Okay, that's that. So we've covered blood supply a few times. There it is again. Let's see if we got is this just a dandy? Yeah, that's just dandy. Okay. All right. Anything you want to review? Well, why don't you have a look at the post test? And if anything is confusing there, bring it up. We'll get through it. And then that's it. There's one more virtual event that we had together. We'll go over our functional areas. And then we have an exam, a final exam. I will give you some practice questions for the final exam. I'll put it on. Um, Exam soft, examplify, exam or whatever you call it. It'll be one of those. So you can take that. Um, I don't know if I can let you take it multiple times. I don't know if that's an option. Anyway, you'll have it at least once. <laughs> so you can uh, take a look at some questions that will be on there. All right, let me know if you have any questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, I need to email everyone. Uh, the third, the third has it. I think the don't cares might actually have it, but um, the cares, third, third has it.